It's my pleasure to call on stage Lakshmi Paturi, the founder of Inc., who's going to be conducting the next part of this conference. You know, Lakshmi has so many things. You know, she's, she's famous in so many ways. She's on Forbes' lists of 100 influential women in the world. She's had such an accomplished career, whether at Intel or in, in so many other things. But for me and for a whole generation of young people, and I'm putting myself in the young people bracket still, you know, in India, and from India, she's extremely inspiring as the person who brought TED to India and who has created and sustained Inc. in the face of incredible odds and who every day inspires us to believe in this idea of, of a better India and then gives us the courage to actually make it happen ourselves. So, Lakshmi, thank you for being the inspiration you are. Welcome to our own Pop-Up Inc. You should also know that Bombay is very sweaty. So, um, thank you for coming here. Before I invite our next guest, I thought I would, you know, people always ask me, like, how do you find your speakers? You know, how do you, you know, who inspires you? So I'll tell you a little story. Over a decade ago, I was in Portland, Oregon, which, is, which I consider my home, and, uh, you know, I, I'm in love with that place. So I was with a friend of mine, and uh, he said, Lakshmi, there is this book you must read. He was sitting in his library, and he gave me a book called The 20th Wife, and this I'm talking about a dozen years ago. And I read it, and I completely fell in love with the book. And I said, okay, who wrote it? Uh, okay, Indu Sundaration wrote it. Where does she live? It's at Seattle, Washington. And I was in Portland, Oregon. And I somehow searched on the web, and I found her. I cold turkey wrote to her, and since then have become really good friends. So when people ask me, how do you find people? I just say, go find them. I mean, they don't find you. You have to go find them. So with that, um, instead of giving a long introduction about Indu, I thought what I would do is I would have her come on stage and take you on a journey of Indu as a writer. Indu. So um, Indu has written a trilogy, of, she's most famous for, she's done many other things, but she's most famous for a trilogy of books, 20th Wife, The Feast of Roses, and Shadow Princess. But, you know, Indu, I'm more interested in, you know, I think you all should buy the books and read them, and, uh, but what I want to talk about is the process. You know, the thing that always fascinates me is the journey that's behind a product. Uh, we always see that, we see the success, but there's a long journey to that. So. You know, Indu, I wanted to start with how did you, did you always know you were a writer or how did you start the process of being a writer? Well, um, I went to the U.S. for graduate school and I have a couple of degrees, uh, an MA in economics and a, an MS in operations research. I started writing as soon as I finished my degrees because I figured I'd done what was expected of me. I satisfied everybody who said I needed to get an education. I got an education. Um, and then I wrote a novel. And, you know, I, when people ask me, how do you make the transition from economics to writing fiction, I always say economics is so much fiction anyway. <laughs> it's not so difficult, you know, to, to start writing. But um, it, it really began like that. And I started writing uh, in December of 1993. And The Twentieth Wife isn't the first book I wrote. I've written two novels before this. Um, and I, I, you know, by about 94, I was already thinking the two novels I wrote weren't any good. And they aren't. They really aren't any good. And so um, I had stumbled upon Nur Jahan's story while I was at graduate school. And I decided that I wanted to go back and research that and write that book because I thought that book would perhaps touch a chord with people more than anything else that I could do. Uh, but tell me what about Noor Jahan really uh, interested you? Well, um, so I grew up, um, I want to say I was a very poor student of history, really. I never paid attention in class. And if you've gone through school here as I did, I'm sure this will sound familiar to you. I would get punished by being hauled up to the front of the class to stand there 
as an example of what you're not supposed to be doing in history class. And so, I mean, I, you know, I would constantly get punished in history class. I never paid any attention because to me it was, um, the way I was taught history was, um, you know, here's a date of the battle. You have to learn when the first battle of Panipat was. And then these are the years of rains, but you've got no sense of the people behind it. These, these people who loved and breathed and, um, you know, hated and um, we have this, this vibrant past. Um, and for some reason, the stories are lost. And when you do history in India, as I did, uh, you start with the Indus Valley civilization and you, uh, I ended with, uh, you know, uh, in the independence movement. And that's a lot of ground to be covering in something like eight years of schooling. So, and, and when they get to the Mughals, they just zip right past them. It's like you learn about the, the top six, the first six Mughal emperors. If you hear about the women at all, it's only because they were the mothers of heirs, and so they gave birth to the next emperor. And how, yet somehow or the other, you do hear about Nur Jahan. And the thing about Nur Jahan is that she is Emperor Jahangir's 20th wife, hence the title of the first novel. She marries him when she's 34 years old, and he's 42. She's been married once before. And it was really this, truly this grand, grand love story. I mean, uh, you think of the next generation, Shah Jahan, who was her stepson, and Mumtaz Mahal, who was actually her brother's daughter, so her niece. Um, theirs is the big grand love story because of the Taj. But uh, for a 42-year-old man in Mughal India to marry a 34-year-old woman who had been married once before, and there were so many disadvantages she had. You know, she, uh, they got married in May of 1611, and just before that, uh, her father, who was treasurer of the empire, had embezzled 50,000 rupees from the imperial treasury. Her oldest brother, Muhammad Sharif, had attempted to assassinate Jahangir, and he was actually put to death for that. Um, and then she'd been married to this Persian soldier who killed one of Jahangir's favorite uh, ministers, a childhood friend, whom he'd made a minister when he became emperor. So. It had to be love. I mean, this woman really brought nothing to the table. She, she, was, not, she was not a king's daughter. She was not a raja's daughter. She, there, were no, there was no political advantage to marrying her. And every one of his 19 marriages before that had been political. And in his old age, when he was 42, he said, I'm going to marry this woman. He marries her um, in 1611. He dies in 1628. In those intervening 17 years, he makes her the most powerful woman in that entire dynasty. She signs on imperial farmans, which was a privilege only accorded to the emperor. She has coins minted in her name, and that was unheard of, it's still unheard of. There's no other woman in Indian history who was not a reigning sovereign who had her name on a coin. And um, the only thing, the other mark of sovereignty in Mughal India was um, having the khutba, um, this proclamation of sovereignty read, um, in, you know, after the Friday noon prayers in every mosque around the empire, because that was the only way they could actually let the entire population know who their king was and towards whom they should be bowing their heads. And so the khutba was read in Emperor Jahangir's name, but Nur Jahan had pretty much everything else. Now, obviously, historical fiction is a is an interesting category so you read the history but you wanted to write it in a way that it would be accessible to everyone what was your thinking in actually writing 20th wife you, you know what i was fascinated by and i, I still am i'm um, i'm on my sixth book now i have a book coming out in october called the mountain of light which is about the kohino diamond um, I want to write about the women of India because I really feel that in many ways we really haven't had a voice and the history has been written by the men and I don't mean any disrespect to the men in the audience, it happens to be true. And the women's stories have been lost, you know, the women in the Mughal harems lived in harems, so they were sort of these non-entities, they were behind a veil, uh, they lived within the walls of a harem, they weren't, they were heard, not so much seen. Um, and yet they were extremely powerful. So I wanted to write women's stories. Uh, so I mean, 
I, I do write stories from male points of view. I have a collection of short stories where there are male protagonists who take center stage. And I have a great deal of fun doing that. But it's the women's stories that um, I really enjoy telling. No, what was your research like? So tell me, how long did you research before you wrote 20th Wife? So um, um, when I was writing, the, I, I should tell you the story, because my, my husband and I had um, just gotten married. We just finished grad school and you know first jobs in Seattle. So we were quite poor at that time. So when I wanted to write a novel, I said, we need to buy a computer. I can't handwrite it. So we searched around for the money and bought ourselves a computer. And at that time, the way Microsoft Word worked was that if you um, did not attach your computer to a printer, you would not know how many pages you were writing. For some reason, it wouldn't tell you that. So I wrote my first two novels without knowing how many pages I'd written. And then I eventually said, hey, can we dig up some money and buy a printer? Because I have no idea what I've put on the, on the desk. And it turned out to be each thing, each novel was like 400 pages. So, OK, so you know, I mean, I, I can write it. It's not a big deal. When I started researching um, The 20th Wife, the, the great thing about the US, really, I mean, it, it, I, I had, as somebody who was essentially nobody at that time, you know, I could go to the University of Washington's libraries. They happened to be in Seattle. Um, there's a local library system called the King County Library System. And when I, um, and between the two of them, they have every English translation of, you know, the Pacha Nama, the Jahangir Nama, the Akbar Nama, the Eni Akbari. Um, they had Manucci and they had Bernier and anybody that you could think of who traveled to Mughal India at that time. Uh, and whatever I couldn't get, it's just the way the library systems work. I said, I, I remember getting a couple of books from Harvard, which is 3,000 miles you know, in the, in the other direction. It's all the way across the country. And I said, um, you don't carry these books. How do I get them? And they said, hey, just do an interlibrary loan. So. I put in a request, it came to me, I kept those books for a month, I returned them, and I was done. It, it, it's easy, it wasn't hard, really. Uh, after that it was just, then I had to discipline myself to read and take notes, and I've taken copious notes. I have folders and folders and folders of all kinds of inconsequential information on Mughal India, which never found its way into all the books. So, you know, they, I'm sure, you know, as you're writing, writing is something you do all on your own, and you do it, and you, also said that when you send the script out, it wasn't immediately accepted. So tell us a little bit of your, what were the moments of loneliness like? How did you deal with it? So um, I joined critique groups first. I, so the first creative writing class I took, I took after I had finished The Feast of Roses. So I'd written four novels before I ventured into a classroom to find out whether I'd done anything that was worthwhile. Um, and it. If you're going to be writing, I would suggest that. Don't take a creative writing class. Because writing has to happen within yourself. It's really something that nobody can teach you. And if somebody's going to teach you, you're not going to be a good writer anyway. It has to com come from within yourself. What creative writing classes teach you to do is to edit yourself. They teach you to throw away what's not good. They teach you to keep what's the thing. So I mean, that I, I think that is really the way. Did I answer your question? I feel like I'm drifting a little bit. No, I, I was <laughs> asking about you You sent the script, and it wasn't immediately yes. accepted. Okay. Yes, so. so let's get to that. OK, so I, it took me five. So in the US, the way it works is that publishers have something called a slush pile. They call it a slush pile. So you send them a manuscript unagented. They take it, and they throw it into a room where there are a whole bunch of manuscripts. If you're lucky, 10 years from now, some editor who has nothing better to do with their time will go pull something out and read it and say, hey, this is the next best thing in American fiction. It doesn't happen. So what you need to do is you need to have an agent. And because that's like one level that you've gone through before the publisher sees it. And if your agent is powerful and can bend uh, an editor's ear towards your manuscript, well and good, even better. So I started sending out uh, The 20th Wife. And initially, I'd written both the novels as one. The 20th Wife and the Feast of Roses came to 1,200 manuscript pages. And unless you're Vikram Seth uh, and you write a suitable boy, nobody's going to publish from somebody who, does, who is unknown you know, a 1,200-page book. 
So I cut the book into two very early on in the process, and there was a natural point. I had done a book one and a book two, and so I cut it into two, and I said, here is a more manageable 450-page manuscript that I can go out and shop. I went out. Um, I looked for an agent for five years. So it took me five years to find an agent, and I have maybe 120 rejection letters. And invariably, I was, I was trying something new, because historical fiction is genre, Nobody's really very interested in it. And I was trying to sell it in America, and what everybody asked me invariably was, who is she? Who is this woman you're writing about? So I would say, oh, she's the aunt of the woman for whom the Taj is built, because that's the best way I knew how to explain who she was. And they said, why isn't it about the woman who's, who, for whom the Taj is built? Go back and write that novel. I'll take a look at it. And I said, but that's not the novel I want to write, so maybe you're not right for me. I'm going to send it to somebody else. And so I did that, and I did that, and I did that, and eventually I approached Sandy Dykstra, who's my agent now, and um, happens to be one of, I think, the three best agents in the U.S. But it's, it's one of those things, you know, you, you, there's a time for it to happen. I sent it to her, and, um, and you know, they wrote back, and they said, we want to see the first 50 pages, and then they called, and they said, uh, we want to see the whole book, and we want an exclusive on it. And then it took her four months of you know, talking to me to see whether we could work together. And then she sent it out to my current publisher. I've been with them for 12 years. Um, and she sent it to my publisher, who is um, head of Atria Books in Simon & Schuster. I'm published by Simon & Schuster. And um, I've asked Judith over the years, why did you publish me? Why did you even look at my book? And Judith happens to be Australian. And she said it was colonial empathy. I said, hey, <laughs> anything, you know, I was glad to have, you know, anything that makes us connect with each other. And Judith got the book, got the manuscript on a Friday and she had it photocopied and sent to five people in the, in the publishing house and they all read it over the weekend and on Monday, uh, we sent it to like 10 publishing houses. On Monday they came back and said, everybody else is off the table, we are on the table. And that was the end of it. So. So, so my, my question is still about that five years okay. where you keep sending and it keeps coming back and you're, all, you're still writing, you're still doing something. How do you keep your positive spirit? What do you tell yourself that so keeps you going? You know, I, have a, um, I went through creative writing classes with, um, <laughs> with one particular teacher who then ended up becoming, is still now, a very good friend of mine. She writes uh, young adult fiction and fantasy. Her name is Janet Carey. And one of the things Janet used to always say in her classes, because she was publishing and you know, she'd gone through the process herself, she would say um, that you have your next letter already written, so you know you're approaching somebody, assume they're gonna say no. So you have your next letter already written. So when you get that rejection letter, before you have a chance to feel depressed, put that other letter in the mailbox and then come back and then feel depressed and feel sorry for yourself. But that other letter is already on its way, you know, going to somebody who might say yes. And I think it, it, it's good advice. It's basically you've got to pick yourself up and go. If you want to do it, you've got to persist. So maybe can you read a little bit from, uh, from your book? Okay, I'm going to read from The Twentieth Wife. Um, and this is just to, you know, give a peek into what she does so we, you immediately go out and buy all the rest <laughs> of the books. <laughs> and also watch the TV show because we're going to talk Oh, no, about later, later. Oh, later, later, okay. Later, okay. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm going to set this up a little bit because The 20th Wife is essentially um, how um, Noor Jahan, who is Mehronisa at that time, um, ends up getting married to Emperor Jahangir at the end of the novel. And The Feast of Roses, which is a sequel, is about her life as Empress. Shadow Princess, the third of the Taj trilogy, actually skips a generation and begins with Mumtaz Mahal dying, and Jahanara, who's 17 years old, is at her mother's side. She is the princess who grows up in the shadow of the Taj. Um, when I'm asked to read really short passages, I end up reading this passage from The Twentieth Wife, because to me, it has all the drama, and it ends really well, and it's really short, and it has practically nothing to do with the main characters of the book. I might as well tell you that ahead of time, because, um, during when Salim, uh, when Jahangir was Prince Salim, he was sort of battling his father, Emperor Akbar, the whole time through. And uh, so Akbar, to give him some responsibility, all this is historically accurate, sends him off on a Mewar campaign, you know, to Udaipur, and he says, go conquer the Rana of Udaipur and 
uh, annex Udaipur to the Mughal Empire. And I wanted to give just like the short scene, I wanted to give a, like a brief introduction to the reader who doesn't know anything about Mewar and Udaipur, about what it meant to the Rajput kings to actually lose their land. The story is not about them, it's about the Mughals. Um, and yet I wanted to bring in this other point of view, and so I wrote this tiny scene, and this is what it is. By this time, 1599, the Mughal Empire stretched vast across the map of Hindustan, embracing Kandahar and Kabul in the northwest, Kashmir in the north, Bengal to the east, and south to Berar. The Khutba, the official proclamation of sovereignty, was read before the noon prayers every Friday in the melodious voices of the muezzins from mosques around the empire. All hail Akbar Pacha, Lord Most Mighty. In central India, the emperor had managed to subdue even the Rajput kings, valiant warriors and a fierce, proud race. As each kingdom was conquered, its daughters, sisters, cousins and nieces were given in marriage to the imperial family, cementing newly formed alliances and ensuring against further rebellions. One kingdom still held out. Udaipur lay southwest in Rajput land, a rugged, harsh land of low-lying mountains, bare plains and scrub. Water and rain were a distant memory. The scorching Thar desert lay to the north. But Udaipur, under a brutal burning sun, stood on the banks of the Pichola Lake. Around it, replete with the waters of the lake, the land was fertile, green and lush surrounded by the bare hills of the countryside. Here Rana Pratap Singh had ruled with a stubbornness and arrogance that could only come from being a Rajput, proud of being from an unconquerable people and angry at the presumption of anyone, even a great emperor, at thinking of his land as part of a greater empire. Rana Pratap Singh died in a hut on the banks of the lake. Through the windows of his shack, he could see the brick and mortar walls of the palace a previous Rana had commenced building, but during his reign there had not been enough peace to complete the palace. His son stood around him as he lay on his hay-stuffed mattress, vowing to continue Pratap Singh's fight against Akbar, swearing that until every last breath left their bodies, they would not give up their land to be swallowed by the widespread Mughal Empire. As the eldest of his 17 sons and his heir apparent, Amar Singh, came through the doorway to pay his last respects to his father, his turban caught on one of the slats of the roof and was wrenched off his head. And so Pratap Singh, that mighty Rana who had staved off the Mughal Empire, died with this image in his mind. That his son, turbanless and so relaxed, would live a life of ease, that he would not rule for very long, that he would lose this beloved kingdom. Thank you. So there is a, yeah, there is a um, logical ending to this conversation. Uh, you know, Indu left India in 1989 and she's been in US and she's back here doing something very interesting that's going to bring her stories to you. So to talk about that, I would love to have Mahesh come tell us what is the next chapter of the story. And Mahesh used to run Disney in India. Now he himself, and by the way, he's an author. He's uh, you know, into wine and all kinds of things. Uh, I would love for him to tell us for a, <laughs> for a couple of minutes about this new journey of him as well as Indu. Uh, Lakshmi always likes to spring these things on us. Um, uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Epic Channel. Uh, after having left Disney last year, I thought that television in India is, is quite homogenized and is in a place that needs some differentiation. It's a little bit like Hindi films were in the 80s. I don't know how many of you remember Hindi film in the 80s. But it, uh, that's the dark era of Hindi films. So I feel uh, similarly that there is an opportunity in television to get differentiated content. And in about three months, hopefully, given government approvals, uh, we should be launching um, India's first history and mythology-based channel called the Epic Channel. It's going to be in Hindi. And it's going to be available mainly in digital households. It's not going to be available in the analog world. And that sets for more differentiation in television as you, uh, as you go along. 
Uh, and in that connection, actually, it was fascinating for me because the first, uh, so even before I set up the, uh, the television channel, we got rights for in those books, uh, all three of them, the Taj trilogy, and we intend to produce The Twentieth Wife as a television show. And the idea here is, of course, to do episodic television or to do it in short seasons and not stretch it like you see in television today. So hopefully we'll keep the drama, we'll keep the mystique, and we'll keep the energy of the, uh, of the writing. You know, we've, uh, just to give you a flavor of what's coming, if you go to the Facebook page, we have a page called Epigrams, which takes Indian history and gives it a modern twist. The idea here is, of course, to not look at history as a, it's not a history channel, it's just uh, an entertainment channel, and you'll get a sense of it when you look at epigrams. So uh, thank you, guys. It's great being here. Parmesh, this is a great place you got. Thanks. So thank you, Indu. I think with the epic channel plus your books, I think our kids would be interested in history much better than we ever were when we went to school. So thank you. Thanks, Lakshmi. Thank you.